The Pikes Peak Hill Climb is one of the oldest and most grueling races in the US, where racers drive their cars 12 miles up a mountain, going through 150 turns and over 5,000 feet in elevation changes. And today, we are gonna take a look at this race car, which is built specifically to tackle that race. And we're gonna talk to the driver that will pilot it up the mountain. Hey, Matush, thanks for bringing out your, your car. Am I saying your name correctly? Yeah, you do. Matush. Matush? Okay. Good to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you as well. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background and what got you into racing on the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Uh, getting me to racing on Pikes Peak Hill Climb, I think so it's fault of Dan Aveda. Okay. Because uh, we raced WRL Racing Series, the Endurance Racing Series, and uh, it's also my dream to race Pikes Peak. Yeah. And when I was growing up, it was a big portion of it. And uh, we were at uh, endurance race at Kora, and the guys we were talking about the Pikes Peak, and then it's racing. I think so seventh year now. Oh wow! Okay. Or eighth, and his son it's third year. Yeah. And they are like uh, last year. You know what you should do because it's a hundred, so you should actually do it year earlier than you are planning. Sure. <laughs> and somehow it got all together, and all, all of a sudden you are filling up the paperwork for sign up, January comes in and you get accepted. So it's like, uh, okay, this just hit the wall. We yeah. <laughs> need to have the car ready. So last year was the 100th anniversary yes. of the Pikes Peak Hill yes, Climb. Correct. And that was your rookie year that racing on the 100th anniversary. So that's pretty cool to be able to say it was that amazing. my first year was the 100th of, was, the, yeah. of the race. It was a lot of first because for a lot of the drivers it was first. It was big because of 100 year. Yeah. It was big part because my father was able to be there with sure. me. He was able to give me the green flag. Oh wow, that's cool. So he did started me on the race day. Yeah. Uh, I have also a really good crew, friends of mine that uh, literally they are doing it for passion, helping me. So Martin, Marek, Richard, my father, they are just helping me all the time. That's so it's so just cool. it's just amazing. That's so cool. Well, well, tell me a little bit about this car and why you chose, because I see you're racing an Audi TT up yeah. the hill and you're doing it again this year. This is the same car as last year, right? It is the same car and it's not the same car. You know how it goes with the race cars. Sure. <laughs> Every yeah. year you keep on adding stuff. But yeah, it started as a 2010 Audi TTS. I bought it on auction with front end damage. Oh, okay. The funny thing is all the parts are still there. Wow. I uh, removed what didn't need to be there. I simplified as much as I could on the car for last year. And last year we experienced some issues during the race day. So it was a really bitter day. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So we didn't made it to the top, but uh, we learned from it. We did modifications to the car. This year we actually widened up the body. Well, yeah, see, I, I, I noticed that. So you've got, it looks like wider fenders here. Is that because you just wanted to run like a wider width tire up yes, the hill? Yes, that's where it all started because we couldn't fit nothing bigger than 275 millimeter tire to the back. Okay. And we were pushing the car so much that the rear tire was used only outside two thirds of the tire. So the car was start leaning so much into the turns, we oh were losing gosh. actually the tire. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we need to do something with it. <laughs> What's the simplest solution? Wide body. <laughs> yeah. Well, this gives you definitely a bitter, a bigger contact. Oh yes, patch, right? of course, to get, 295s. It, yeah, so now you get a lot more grip and yeah. probably a little more life out of your tires as well. What are mm. you running under the hood? And is it possible? I know you've got hood pins in here. Is yeah. it possible to see what you're running of under course. the hood here? Uh, it's a secret, but I'll let you peek in. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, you tell me what to do. I don't want to break your... No, you're not going to. Oh, this is a race go. car. Okay. This doesn't break. And if it does, <laughs> it's bad. So wow. this is our creation. That is really cool. So is this the stock motor or is this something that you swapped in? Uh, the stock engine we used for the first year. Okay. For first year of my racing. Second year of my racing, which was the first year of Pike Speak, okay. we fully built the engine so we can run a bigger turbo wow. because of the hill climb. Yeah. And uh, so the engine is fully built. We've built internals, lots of modifications done to it. For this year, we did modifications, especially on the turbo side, yeah. to make sure that we don't experience the same failure. 
and uh, then the biggest thing which is huge for this year uh, it's this bad boy from Vibrant Performance. Okay, I cool. have to say their name because they are just absolutely awesome. Is it? Well, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. So, uh, do you know about? Have you dynoed this? Do you know about yes, what kind did. of power you're putting down? Are you Are you able to tell us? Yes. That's, okay. That's <laughs> luckily that's not a secret. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, 462 horsepower to the four wheel drive wheels. Wow. And we are producing 375 foot pound of torque. Wow, and so do you generally account for about what a ten percent drivetrain loss, or because it's all around drive twelve a more? Right, it's 12. a four-wheel drive, so it's around twelve to fifteen. It's that number. Everybody has different. Yeah. So it's uh, the real way of doing it is put the engine on the engine dyno. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you can calculate because every car is going to be a little different. Yeah. But yeah, the roughly, t I would say twelve to fifteen percent somewhere there is the drivetrain loss on it but you don't feel it on the car. And what, what do these run stock? So I just want to know like stock, how big of a jump you've made. Audi saying 288 horsepower on the engine. Wow. So that's so about <laughs> 210 on the wheel. Yeah, so you've probably jumped a good 250 plus horsepower. Something like that. Over the stock motor. So Something that's, like that. yeah, that's pretty significant. You've you've more than uh, doubled the horsepower. It's, it's fine output out of it. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> it, and not only fun. that, but I'm noticing holding up this hood, this is the, can't be the stock hood because is. this, is it the stock hood? Yeah, if you take closely where your the thumb is, yeah. uh, that's no more inner, that's all cut out. Oh. So if you look at the inside edges, they're a little rough. Gotcha. I see that now. Okay, because I was I was feeling this hood, and I'm it, like, this is light. like a super light hood. And that was the thing. The carbon hood was actually seven pounds heavier than was this. I'm like, why am I going to be buying carbon hood? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. I mean, a little bit of ingenuity, and you got something that's even lighter than the carbon fiber hood. That's what we are trying you. to do. You know yeah. what I mean? Because uh, I built this car in the garage. I had help with, uh, of course, it's not that I did everything. Sure. I had help uh, from guys from Apicol, Troy and Doug. Uh, there was a bunch of people, a bunch of research. I had friends in Europe that were helping with certain stuff. And you know, it's like you put a lot of hats together and you come up with a solution that's going to work. Yeah. And uh, every time you're looking at the cost. Well, tell me a, a little bit more about this car. So you've got some pretty aggressive body work going on <laughs> even here like i like how you you have these fender flares out and then you even have is this like a little bit of uh the whole flow yeah the whole idea for? behind that is uh this car creates because if you look at the brakes yeah this car is using a porsche cayenne uh turbo i think so or porsche cayenne s wow it's 18z calipers they are huge oh yeah <laughs> and they big. create, I'm running uh, G-Lock brake pads on them. Okay. R16 compound, which is super aggressive compound. So this car stops on a dime, but yeah. it creates a lot of heat. So that's where we got in the front. We had a lot of air coming to cool down the brakes, but we were having problems to evacuate it from the wheel. Yeah. And the flares, when they arrived, that corner was empty. I'm like, okay, let's, some, let's create something creative from materials that we have available. So I created a small slot. And in the speed, the idea behind it is the air hits the slot, comes out. And when, when it comes out here, you have a regular air traveling at normal speed of the car. The, this here gets compressed and it shoots it out like your air gun. Well, okay, wow. And that way it creates a little bit of the vacuum around the front face of the wheel and helps to push, pull the air through the wheel that comes enter here. And it works. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Because the first testing, usually we had a lot of the brake dust on the inner wheel. Yeah. Right now the inner wheel is nice and clean and the front face of the wheel is all black, dirty. <laughs> I'm like, I guess it's working. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and then I noticed you, you have maybe like the world's smallest side mirrors here is they are for they are actually panoramatic weight? oh okay so you'll be surprised you can see a lot in really? them you can see really a lot but you know the factory mirrors they are like uh, the ears from uh D dumbo is the oh dumbo ears, elephant yep. <laughs> <laughs> so literally they're just huge so you're lucky we have to go for something smaller <laughs> well and then this wing here is this all a carbon fiber wing yes. on the top here yeah that, oh, that's, that's really a cool. solid carbon fiber 
and ah, oh, solid. It's hollow actually inside. Oh, it's hollow. Okay. It's hollow. Two two halves. They were glued. I purchased it the way it is. Nice. That was not us. I'm not gonna take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> then you got a pretty aggressive. Uh, rear diffuser here and then a really cool looking center mounted exhaust. I kind of dig that actually. It's pretty cool. I liked it. I like the whole idea of having the center exhaust on it and uh, it is, It's actually straight pipe three inch from the turbo all the way back But uh, when we first started with the straight pipe, it sounded ho Just horrible really screeching really not nice sound. So again, I went to Vibrant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey guys, I need something make this sound better so they supply us this muffler which is probably three inches long yeah that's it <laughs> well i know all of our viewers are going to wonder what does it actually sound like so let's cut to that now so this is our safety switch right here it's a solid state and it powers up the car so my dashboard comes on that's a picture from last year now this is my control for the whole car so i turn on the computers I turn on the injectors and the ignition system. These are my fuel pumps. And this is a start. So I see you've got a goose on the side of your car here. It's actually on both sides. There has to be an interesting story behind this. There it is. My last name, Huaska, is a goose in English. Okay. So that's the reason why there's a goose. The logo was designed by my niece, Alexandra, and uh, she designed it for my younger brother because he's racing in Europe. Okay. And he's racing with his little son and uh, his daughter designed this logo. So it's a goose with a pumpkin or watermelon helmet with the pilots. The little aviator the goggles aviator. there. And that's the exhaust. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she designed it for us and I'm so proud that I can have it on a car. Yeah. I asked the permission. <laughs> I, I was approved that yes, you can have it. So that's the reason why it's with us. <laughs> well, that's, that's very cool that you're it's able to have that. It's a part of family yeah. that it's with me on the car during the run it's so. cool that you can take that up the hill with you oh yeah no it's uh, that's what i said i want to have that with me yeah and that way i have part of my family with me all the time because in the end of the day we all do this for fun but if the family is not there it's kind of it, it just loses a lot so for sure totally well I, I, we've taken a pretty good tour of the outside of your car Let's dive into the inside because you've got a lot of interesting stuff going on in there. Yeah. Give us a little bit of tour of, of what you've got and uh, what everything does. So we probably start with this outside. This is the safety net that goes all the way out. And uh, oh, it got a little stuck here. So th this is the safety net that goes out here. Okay. And it protects me in a case of accident. Sure. In case some debris wants to enter the car or something like that. Uh, we run uh, FIA approved racing seats with the harness, six point harness. Uh, removable steering wheel. So, in case of accident, I have a lot more space to get out of the car. Makes sense. So you can see it almost looks like uh, the sim racing, but these are aluminum magnetic uh, pedal shifters that I control the car with. Seems like you're, you're taking a lot of steps for lightweight. <laughs> uh, yes, and also so you feel it every time you shift, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people will notice that it has the automatic shifter in the uh, center console, even though it's DSG, so dual clutch transmission. Okay. So I do have a brake and a gas. I don't have a clutch. I don't need a clutch, but it's a six-speed manual transmission. Nice. Uh, this is my display, which controls it gives me all the information from the car during the run. So I have just rough numbers and rough ideas what's happening with the car. Most of the time, you don't have time to look at it because the turns are coming so quick. So we have What's like up. the most prominent thing that's on there that you see that you're uh, looking for the most? Gear, which gear you are at because you can get lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the amounts of the shifts up and down, uh, sometimes well, yeah, you're it's going, nice to look at it. You're going, what, what is it, 156 at? turns? 157, I think. Or is it 157 or 150? Somewhere, so, a little somewhere more, around 150 there. 150 turns. <laughs> so, uh, so I can imagine uh, 
you know, after a hundred of those turns, you're yeah, starting you, to you, lose you, track. You get, yeah, you, you lose the track which gear you're at, and uh, RPMs, RPMs. But all the display is mainly there to give me warnings. So if anything is going wrong with the car, the computer is set up that way, it will start flashing red right at me yeah. with the letter. So you notice that, you peek down with the eyes really quickly, okay, what's going on? So that, that's the main reason why the display is there, but 80, 90% of the time, you don't peek at it much. Okay. You just, you see it, that it's there, you see the motions and stuff changing there, but it's not like you're looking at it. You're a lot more focused on yes, the road in ahead front of, of you, you, right? Yeah. So the center, con center console is pretty much just 12 switches and uh, the way they operate, I'm going to quickly turn it on, they go through the self-check every time you turn it on, so they're going to let me know as a driver that all of the switches are fully operational and we have our ignition one, ignition two, fuel pumps, starter, this one is lights, this is the windshield wiper, so we have a intermittent first and second speed. Then I have a heater, cool shirt, which is not in here because it's still a little cold in the mornings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we have, uh, this one is our Sentinel system for the onboard video. Okay. And uh, this one is a so-called flasher. So when I press it, uh, the car automatically will flash the lights. Wow. For me. So I don't have to, that's because there's no controls around. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, and... Uh, you kind of centralize it all into one little yeah, panel there. Make, makes it simpler for me what to do. And uh, you can see the fire handle here. That's pretty much your lifesaver in case something really goes wrong. Do you just pull it and you then a fire it, suppression system? The fire system? suppression system is on the passenger on the floor. And there's a jet that goes directly on the fuel cell. Yeah. That is un covered underneath the big aluminum t tank and uh, I have four feet for both sides of the feet and in the engine bay. Wow. To that's, kind of... That's cool. That's I, a t <laughs> that buys you time if something goes really wrong. Yeah. It buys you time to get out of the car. I would lose track of what each button does, so it's pretty impressive that mm. you have that all memorized already. You get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. <laughs> yeah. So the Pikes Peak Hill Climb is such a grueling race because you are racing from essentially about a 9,000 foot elevation at the start, right? Yeah. Maybe a little over 9,000 feet over. to over 14,000 feet at the top. <laughs> and I think that has to take like a heavy toll on the car as well as the drivers that are going up in that much of elevation it does. in such a short amount of time. So tell me a little bit about how you personally prepare and how it affects the car going up that hill. The me personally, I try to focus. That's where my crew helps me the most when we get to the bottom of the hill or to the testing area. They prep the car, they ask me the basic information about what pressures, what they need to do. They prep that and it allows me to get mentally ready and also brief. I take a lot longer breaths, make sure that I can get as much oxygen in my body as I can. Uh, some guys, they run a uh, sniffer. Oh, Oxy a little oxygen? Oxygen, yeah. yeah. On, on board oxygen system. I don't. Uh, maybe it will be worth it. I don't know. I never sure. tried. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it gets a toll. You get to the top of the mountain or top of the testing section and you feel the altitude for sure. Yeah. Your heart rate is going through the roof. So when you stop, you need to be a little cautious. <laughs> sure. Well, and, and how about the car? Because we generally say here, because we do some drag racing mm -hmm. at, you know, maybe five, 6,000 feet. And we always have to tell people like, hey, our times are going to be a little bit slower because mm -hmm. we're up here at elevation. Yeah. And you're starting way higher than we are and finishing <laughs> even higher than that. So I can only imagine the amount of like, uh, power degradation that you have on cars like this. Now you have a turbo, so you're probably losing a little bit less than the non-turboed mm -hmm. cars, but it still has to take a toll, right? Oh yeah, it does. Uh, the, we don't lose as much as natural aspirated cars, power-wise. I would probably say we lose 10% uh, less than okay. the NA cars. I don't know the numbers exactly, so sure. don't quote me on that. Yeah. <laughs> but definitely we lose power. Yeah. The bigger problem that we have against NA cars, we create a lot more heat. Because the turbo is still trying to pack the same amount of the air into the engine, even though there's no air to pack. So we create tremendous amount of the heat for the car. 
on a engine oil, transmission oil, coolant, and that's the biggest stall on the car. So our radiators are oversized. Wow. We carry a lot more oil than normal car would carry inside. The lines are bigger. Everything is just oversized to make sure that we can get the heat away from the car. We also try to do altitude-based fans where the fan doesn't come on because of the temperature, it comes on because of the altitude to try to pull, pull the air through the radiators even more. Man. So things like this, but yeah, the car gets tall. There's so much <laughs> that goes into it, oh, it and I hadn't even <laughs> thought of like all the additional downsides that you have to turboing a car. That's, that's oh, yes. really interesting. It well, is. It's been such a pleasure to be able to take a look at your car and I will certainly be rooting for you uh, to make it at a really good pace up the mountain this year. And thank you so much for bringing your yeah, car out. Thank you. It's thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. I would like to thank you all the guys that stand behind me. That's my crew. Martin, Martin uh, Paterka, Marek Kalina, Richard Kalina, my dad, Jan Haska, all of my family that uh, supports me. <laughs> and all of our sponsors that stand behind us, that's Granite World, Toyo Tires, Motul Oils, Vibrant Performance, we have Avalon Motorsports, Apical, there's lots of companies, lots of friends that, yeah, it's, we could stand here for a long yeah. time to, <laughs> to get all the names, but yeah, sure. everybody that helps me, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because it's just, it's amazing. Well, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this deep dive on what it takes to have this cool car go up that Pikes Peak Hill climb. This has been Brendan, Case Behind the Camera. Take care, guys. Bye.